Okay, so the English, uh, so we're on Acts 19. So Acts 19 is through the Acts series we've been preaching. Uh, so we'll go through the explanations as uh, once we finish reading it. There is three divisions here. Um, this is, uh, if you remember, it talks about a baptism here, about John's baptism. And that was from probably what they learned from Apollos. Remember Apollos? We learned last week Apollos was there. Um, and then Aquila and Priscilla taught him more accurately the way of God. See here, and he knew John's baptism. And then he ended up going to Corinth. And that's um, where he is at the beginning of this chapter. And Paul is coming back. Now this is Paul's third mission now. Third mission. And he's coming to Ephesus. Uh, so if you do have your Bibles, if not, if you can see it, I've got the screens up there. Um, yeah. If, it's, if you can see it, because I can't see if it's boldened or, or some of the words, but it's there just because they will stick out to you so you guys can understand what I'm trying to say. Point one is verse 1 to 10, and that is we must continue to teach God's word correctly, even when rejected by the world. Uh, let's read together. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul travelled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? He asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. It's the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. All right, so you guys can see now what I was mentioning earlier. So while Apollos there, there's a map that should come up shortly. Now I see the green, that's where Paul is. And that's his third mission map. That's, that's where he's traveling. He's right now is at Ephesus. And as they're saying about Apollos, Apollos is there in the yellow at Corinth. Now, as he comes to Ephesus, he finds some disciples there. And then he asks them about the Holy Spirit. Now, they don't know about it. It's because Apollos only knew about John's baptism. It wasn't until it was explained earlier. And then Paul tells them here, he continues to teach them the word of God. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. So you that you believe in the one that is to come. Now, the one that is to come is Jesus. And that's what Paul was teaching there. See, and then even when he went into the synagogue, the synagogue is the church. Went in there, telling him about the kingdom of God, and they hardened. See, the way, that's what it was called before. That's what followers of Jesus were called before. It was the way. Before Christians, it was called the way. Now, he went into synagogues, and again, they were hardened. They didn't want to hear it. So he left them. He took his disciples and went to the hall of Tyrannus, and he starts continuing preaching there until everyone heard the word of God. Now, the Colossae church in Colossians comes out from this. This is how Colossae started. It's because Epaphroditus heard the word Paul preaching in Ephesus, and he went and planted a church in Colossae, where he's from. Now, if you notice the similarities, this is pretty much how Gangwa Mamahi Mohau started. We knew Jesus. We knew who God was. We didn't actually know no Jesus. It wasn't until my uncle came in Campsie, we started at Campsie. I wasn't part of the church then, but I still know the history, right? We went there, started at Campsie. My uncle came explained the word more properly, beginning to understand. And then what happened? The church that we were in started slandering the way. They didn't believe it. So what happened? We got kicked out. We got kicked out, and then we ended up at Sonny's house. We started teaching there, learning more, learning more. And then from there, I think we went to Padstow. And then down here and now here. So if, as you can see, even though the word's been rejected, it's still growing. It doesn't matter. The word is, wherever you preach, there will always be hardened hearts. And that's the three things I want to explain today in this, in this point. Is 
we must know the scriptures. We must know the scriptures correctly. And we need to repent. That's, that's the whole point of preaching. is to repent and believe in the one to come, which is Jesus. Now, for those that are unrepentant, that don't believe in Jesus, what comes next is the wrath and eternal death. See, there's, there's, there's the option. Wrath, eternal death. Especially if you don't want to repent, you don't want to ask for forgiveness of sins, that's your outcome. If you want to repent and believe in Jesus, it's salvation and eternal life. See, there's the other option. That's the first one. The second one is expect rejection and slandering. Whether you, wherever you are, whether you're preaching the word and you're sticking to the gospel, expect people to go against you, regardless. These are people in the church, synagogue, they don't even want to listen to the word of God. If they weren't listening here, well, how do you think they would go out there? So whenever you preach, don't be discouraged. Just expect that, know that there's some people be hardened. And you continue to pray to God for them not to be hardened. See, the kingdom of God, the reason why they're hardened is because the kingdom of God challenges the way they see the world. Some people love the world. They love the worldly kingdom, what we get here. God's kingdom challenges that. And so you'll expect rejection. The third one is, regardless of whatever it is, you're re receiving slandering or you're rejected, you continue, continue spreading the word, wherever you are. So it's an encouragement for us, the church, don't give up. Don't give up if people leave. Don't give up if people start talking bad about you on social media. Who cares? Continue here in the word. Stay in the word. Otherwise, once you kind of come out, you'll start taking all that negative feedback and you'll just lose away. Luke 22, verses 28 to 30. Got it there? If we can see, let's read together. You are those who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Look, there it is there. You stand the trials here. You don't do it on your own strength. You need Jesus. That's why we continue to preach. When you continue to preach, you don't do it because you're strong here. You do it with what Jesus provides us. And that's the trials you'll go through. Don't believe people when they say, come here and you'll be rich. That's a, what a lie. You will struggle. But we don't rely on ourselves, see? We rely on Christ. We continue to teach the word correctly. If you stand with Jesus, he says he will give you a kingdom. These are the promises that we look for. He will give you a kingdom. You will eat at his table. It doesn't cost you a cent. We have to work here to get fed. Yeah, you don't have to. And you are not thrown. You are a kingdom. And that's in Christ. Now, point two is verses 11 to 22. And that is, the church should know who Jesus is and that he is sovereign over all, even the evil spirits. Uh, if we read it, uh, if you can see it, let's read together. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it is necessary for me to see Rome as well 
after sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, just a rough, rough brief on it. It's just Even the cloths, so the handkerchiefs, anything that touched poor skin was healing people. And it wasn't Paul. See, a lot of people look like Paul, uh, Paul's doing it. It's not Paul. It's God doing it through Paul. So God is the one that's doing the miracles here. And they were healing, bringing them to the sick, and they were being healed. Now, there was the seven sons of Sceva here, who were itiner- itinerant, is uh, people that do spells, magic, those type of things. Right? And they were the Jewish exorcists. And that's, this is true, and it's true in the Tongans as well. There is people that actually have the evil spirit. That, that's, that's true. Right? I believe it's true because the Bible tells me that there was an evil spirit in this man. Now, they tried to do the same thing what Paul was doing. Right, and what was everyone else was doing. And they went, they didn't even know who Jesus is, but they just went and said, I command you in the name of the Jesus, Paul preaches, right? And then the evil one answered him, I know Jesus, I know who he is. I recognize Paul, but I don't know who you are. Who are you? And then what happened? They run out, they get wounded, they beat them. And, and it's true, we've seen it, maybe, not, I'm not sure about the young ones, but the older ones, probably my generation, upwards to the parents, They've seen these things in Tonga, um, uh, that there is evil spirits. They're very strong. But this is what, I, what, what I'm trying to get to the point here when, after I finish explaining the text. So the, when they ran out, it became known. Now, everyone came that was practicing magic, collected these books. Now, 50,000 silver coins, one silver coin, so it's a drachma, can feed a family of four for four days. Enough wheat, right, so it's one. To buy a house in ancient Greece is about a thousand silver coins. There was about fifty thousand here worth. So, do you, do you can you see now how they, how Jesus was more revered than everything they collected? All these magic spells and that was nothing after they heard what happened to these seven sons of Sceva. Now, Paul sends his two um, two helpers, as Timothy and Erastus, as in the map that's coming up. So. This is what Paul's deciding. He sent the purple. If you can see the purple, that's where he sent Timothy and Erastus. Anytime you think of Macedonia, think of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. And then Archaea is Corinth. That's Greece. Okay, so, and that's Paul's plan, is to go up to through Macedonia and Archaea, to Jerusalem, right at the corner. And then that will be, he'll be on his way to Rome. We'll see that later on in the chapters. But just so you guys get a fair idea of what's going on. Okay, so now we can see how powerful God is. We can see how powerful he is that he does miracles through his servants. All right? And that's in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. Uh, that's about, um, let me read it to you. I'll read it to you that way so you can hear it. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes if they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So these are the signs and the miracles that will happen for those that believe, right? Will be accompanied with them and it does it with Paul. Now, do we know who Jesus is? Us, the church. Do you know who Jesus is? See, a lot of people will say, yes, I know Jesus. But when it comes to the evil spirits, scared. How many people sleep on with the lights on? How many people are scared to walk at night through the dark place? And they wait for people. You know in Faikawa, when they talk about scary stories, Faikawa men won't go to the bathroom unless someone comes with them. Why? Because they're scared of the evil spirit. This is what happens when you put the evil spirit higher than Jesus. Jesus is higher than them. The evil spirits are scared of Jesus. And that's in these readings that will come up next. And it's not for us to read, it's just so you can see. Matthew 8, 28 to 29. Two demon-possessed men, they came out of the tombs. They were so violent, but they were afraid of Jesus. Same in Luke 4, 41. Demons were being driven out, and they were even saying Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus wouldn't allow them to speak. He was higher than them. But you know, with us, we've kind of lived our way towards where the devil is. Don't sweep at night before the devil comes. 
Don't slip your door to the head. See, these are thongin things. We learn this when we grow up. When the black cat walks past you, don't walk there. Walk the other way. I didn't even know what, what that meant. I didn't, I didn't know what that was meant to do. But this is how we live our life. We should live our life to Jesus. Jesus is higher. Jesus is stronger. Not the devil, not the evil spirits. Yes, we are careful not to invite evil spirits. That's true. But I will live my life according to the word and according to Jesus, not according to what I'm afraid of. I'm more afraid of Jesus than I am afraid of the evil one. Now, I'll show you here the next reading. Revelation chapter 20, and this is verse 10 and 15. Now, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beasts and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is, this is how afraid I am of Jesus. If my name is not in that book of life, I'm in the fire. So when we live our lives, we live our lives according to the word. We can let the gospel change us. And if we're hardened to it, ask him. Pray, Lord, don't harden me. I don't want to be in this fire with the devil. See, the devil, is, he can't do nothing to us unless Jesus allows it. He's got nothing. Job, if you remember Job 1, the devil came and was before God. And God told him, you can do these things to Job, but you can't do this. He couldn't do it. This is why Jesus should guide the way we live. Now, the last point is from verse 23 to 41. And that's in Jesus, we are not confused like the world who use God for worldly gain. Uh, if we can see it, let's read together. This is a bit of a long one, um, but let's see how we go. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the people, temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were with Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to help, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another, because the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front, motioning with his hand. Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. When the city clerk had claimed the crowd down, calmed the crowd down, he said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and do not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and they are pro councils Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact, we're rioting for what happened today. Since there is no justification that we can give a reason for this disturbance, after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, well done. Um, so we see here Demetrius. Now he's a silversmith. Now he makes gods with his hands, and that's the god of the Ephesians. That's Artemis. Now he's threatened by what Paul's preaching. Paul is preaching that gods made by hands are not gods, which is true, but 
this is their business. You begin to see now how much they're going to go against the gospel is because they're going to lose some type of wealth, right? But we can see that he gathers people, the same, same business, and then he starts telling him these things. They drag uh, Paul's companions, that's uh, Artemis, not Artemis, uh, one second, Aristarchus, yep, and uh, Alex, it's Aristarchus, and Gaius. Okay, so they drag them to, um, but the crowd's confused, right? They don't know what's going on, they just join in. So that's the mob mentality. That's the people that will just join something because there's a lot of people there. I mean, we do that often, you know, if we see a big people outside a store, we'll just go there just to look what's going on. And that's what these people did. Uh, now they start drowning out Alexander. He's trying to calm them down. They found out he's a Jew. They don't want to listen to him. And it wasn't until the city clerk came out and he logically told them, what you're doing is, is wrong. Because the people you brought, they haven't done anything to the temple of Artemis. They haven't done anything. But right now you're, in, you're at risk of being charged for rioting because of the disturbance you called. There's legal matters, legal ways you can do it. And that's what he was telling them. We have pro councils, we have um, the Senate and all those things that, that, they, that they mentioned. Go there. And then after they calmed them down, they were dismissed. The main thing I wanted to talk about was the ish, if we can see the businesses today. All right? We can see the same issues there and the same confusion that's here today with God's word. So there's that confusion with God's word. And God's word is almost like a business now. You see, people won't tell you the truth. They will tell you what you want to hear because it's a business to them. They don't see God's word as salvation for eternal life. They see God's word as them benefiting something from it. Either whatever it is, money or they want glory. They always want their name up there for some reason. But that's how it is today. God's word is a business. They'll twist the word just enough for you to come. They will, and, and, and they won't tell you the truth. They just, they see God's word as a business. Now, this is how you can tell the fake Christians, and there's fake Christians out there, the fake Christians from the real ones, right? The genuine ones. The fake ones, they have no concern about feeding God's word properly to God's people. They don't care, right? They will just come here and just feed you something, and then that's off, off you go. Whatever they talk about, they don't live it. It doesn't match their actions. They always, like Alecki was mentioning, people that was always Jesus, Jesus, but they don't show it. There's no, nothing in their actions that show. Everything they know about God is up here. Nothing here. Nothing. It just stops here. All I know, I know the story of this and this. It doesn't change me. They're the fake ones. The genuine ones, they live and walk to the gospel. Their authority on how to live, on what to believe, and who to trust is Jesus. See, they love Jesus so much they just all, all they want to do is talk about Jesus. All they want to do is feed their family Jesus. They want to feed the church, feed Jesus everywhere they go. They don't do it for honor or gain. We don't, no one stands up here for money. You don't get rich here. You, you obviously, once you go to heaven, you get rich, but we don't have richness here. We don't do it for that. We do it because we love Jesus. That's how much we love him, that we will do it for free. It doesn't cost us anything to do it. And they do it because they know the outcome without Christ is, like I mentioned earlier, a death. And then, so don't be confused of God's word. You know, they're confusing God's word nowadays. And you already know it. One day, one person wakes up, he's a man. Next day, he wants to wake up, he's a woman. No one knows. It's confusion. The Bible says there's only two here. You're either a man or woman. That's it. You're not in between. Some people wake up, they want to be a penguin. What the, what's that? Don't do that. It's straight clear here. You're a man or a woman. That's it. No in between. James 4, 4. I've got it up there. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Now just a summary here. Look, let's continue teaching God's word regardless of who rejects us. Continue. Teach the correct scripture. Teach the correct way. We are not afraid of evil spirits. All right? Don't let the evil spirits correct you how you live. Let Jesus correct us how we live. 
He is sovereign over all. And the third one, the last one, as a reminder, we are not confused like the world. Scripture is very clear, clear, straight to the point. It's only us that twist it. It's because we don't understand it, right? Don't be an enemy of God by loving the world. Which one are we? Are we fake Christians or are we true Christians in the Word? Amen.